Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the USQ Salon. Uh, thank you for coming to join us today on this beautiful spring morning. Um, we did turn on the weather especially for you, especially to order, um, so I hope you enjoy the nearly spring day um, in Toowoomba. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today, um, and so thank you all for coming to um, hear her speak. Uh, to start with, though, um, in the spirit of reconciliation, the University of Southern Queensland recognises that it's situated on country for which the Jarawa and Gurrbal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they have performed age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and the unique role that they have played in the life of this region and offer our deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. We uh, also have some housekeeping things. Um, can you please ensure that your phones are set to silent? We are recording the uh, session, so if it rings, you will be embarrassed for time immemorial. So please set it to silent. Uh, the restrooms are in the foyer. And if we are ever so lucky as to have um, a, an alarm of some sort, we only have the one exit. So please don't knock over your fellow uh, people in the rush to get out. Um, make your way orderly out and uh, meet on the northern lawn of the engineering building. Now, for those of you that are directionally challenged, like I am, um, it is in this direction but just follow the crowd and stand in the sun. Um, we were going to live stream, um, but I believe there's some problems with that, so it will be recorded. And we will have a question and answer session at the end. And so your questions can be emailed to the USQ Salon at usq.edu.au, and you can follow us on Twitter at hashtag USQ Salon. Um, We've got the participants online, but seeing it's not live streamed, we'll hopefully record it later on. And so therefore, I would like to um, introduce some important people. Firstly, I'll start with the lady on my left over here, Dr Susie Starfish. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dr Susie Pillen. Um, who, Pillins, I apologise, um, who is a marine scientist, believe it or not, but she has an alter ego, Dr Susie Starfish, and she is our graphic recorder for today. So that's something new. Um, and she has promised that if she is to draw me, she's actually not going to draw me, she's going to draw Elle McPherson. Um, so should you wish her to portray you in a positive light, I'm sure she's open to bribes. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what she draws um, and her interpretation of the events here today. Um, I was particularly um, honoured to be asked to facilitate this session. Um, by background, I'm an engineer. Um, and I'm even one of those rarer breeds. I'm an electrical engineer. And there's very few women, not only in engineering, but especially in electrical engineering. And I've spent a great deal of my career trying to persuade girls that engineering is a fantastic career. But not only engineering, all the other science and technology areas that are underrepresented. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to say. And moving on, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Karen Peterson. So Karen is the Chief Executive Officer for the National Girls Collaborative. She has over 25 years experience in education in schools, universities, administration and research. It sounds like you're a jack of all trades and master of none. No, sorry, I didn't <laughs> say that. Uh, Karen is also the co-principal investigator for several projects and research all funded by the prestigious NSF and seeks to address gender, racial and socioeconomic underrepresentation in the science, technology, engineering and mathematics field. Sorry, did I say engineering? Uh, currently, she's the principal investigator for the National Girls Collaborative Project. This project seeks to maximise access to shared resources for organisations interested in expanding girls' participation in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Currently, the collaborative project, there are 32 collaboratives serving 40 states, 
facilitating collaboration between uh, nearly 23,000 organisations who serve 16.35 million girls and 8.5 million boys. And I think that's quite an interesting statistic because that's probably round about the population of Australia in total. So that's an amazing statistic. In this presentation, Karen will explain how it collaborates to enhance sustainability, organisational effectiveness and shared leadership to increase the ability to offer girls access to these underrepresented fields. And so welcome, Karen, to the lovely spring day in Toowoomba. I need my clicker, which you, you warned me you would walk away with it. Yes, it's fine. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here and so appreciative of all of the preparations and the weather. It's lovely here. I don't really believe that it's winter. People are telling me it's winter, but it's lovely here. And so thank you so much. Um, so I'm uh, especially excited to be talking about something that I've been working on. It's really been my professional passion for the last 15 years. And um, when I was preparing for this, we have so much data and so much information, as you can imagine from working on a project for 15 years. It was actually hard to think about what would be sort of those key nuggets that would be helpful for you here in Australia. But I'm gonna to try to um, provide as much information that would be helpful as you think about your own collaboration and your own work, and then we'll have time at the end for um, questions. So this is really the vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project, to bring together organizations that are committed to encouraging girls in science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm always gonna say it that way now, I think, because of you, <laughs> Sam. Achieved something. Right. Um, and so I wanna tell you a story about how we began and this really is a story, so you kind of get yourself in story mode here, right? So a long time ago, in a place where it rains all the time, and it's dark and gray, and people drink a lot of coffee, this idea was born. Where do you think that might be? Seattle. Seattle. <laughs> Very good. Um, so there were four of us. We got together because um, we wanted to write a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation to create a program for girls. And this was a long time ago, right? And there weren't as many programs as there are now. And so we decided we needed to do a needs assessment. That's what good researchers do, right? Before you write a proposal, you look out, you do sort of a landscape analysis. And so we were looking in the states of Washington and Oregon. And so the four of us sort of divided up that area and started talking to people, educators that serve girls. We started asking them questions to find those gaps in services. And we started hearing similar themes. First, they were isolated. You know, I would talk to somebody who was running a great weekend program for girls, and I would say, who else is doing this work? And she'd say, oh, there's this really amazing woman, you know, in this other town. Tell her I say hello. Like, I haven't seen her for a long time, right? They're, they were very busy doing their work, and they weren't very well connected. They had lots of needs. Uh, they needed professional development. They didn't really know if their programs were having the impact that they wanted them to have because they didn't have good evaluation or assessment. And so I would say, so do you feel like girls are learning more about technology or science? And they would say, well, they come back every week and they like the pizza. And they didn't really know though if eating pizza and coming back on a regular basis was really increasing their interest in STEM, right? Um, they also had needs around some specific towards, sorts of programs they were offering, like mentoring and role models. Uh, one woman said, well, we really want to bring mentors in, but we don't know how to do that. Like, we've been reading some books, but we're not really sure if the strategies we are using are the, the right strategies to use to connect girls with mentors and role models. So I'm sure this has happened to you when you're sort of thinking about an idea, um, other things happen, there's like a synergy that's created. So around that same time, Microsoft had hired a new diversity person and she reached out to me and she said, you know, I want to invite all these people that serve girls to come to the Microsoft campus and I want to give them things and I want to introduce them to Microsoft products and to all of the wonderful women who work here at Microsoft in technology. How do I find these programs? Like, is there a list? 
And then I was also approached by some women at Boeing, uh, female engineers of color, who had formed sort of a, a small group to mentor girls. And they said to me, we really want to bring girls to Boeing and show them the cool work that female engineers can do and inspire them. But we don't know how to find girls. Like, where are the girls that we can invite? So when we all came back together and shared the results of the conversations we'd had, we realized that instead of creating a program for girls, there was a need for an infrastructure, for a network to connect all these programs together and to connect them to corporations and higher education and to provide professional development. And so we created something called the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project. It was a small 18-month grant uh, from the National Science Foundation, and we served Washington State and Oregon State. And that's where we really created this model, this network of connecting educators to each other and to other stakeholders, other people that cared about getting more girls excited about STEM. Um, as we talked about that project and our outcomes and our, and our impact, people from other states in the U.S. would say, we need that in our state. Like, could, could, you, come, could you come to California and do that in, in our state? And so we were fortunate to receive another three-year grant from uh, NSF to replicate, we called that our replication grant, to replicate what we had been doing in Washington and Oregon. And that's where we took the time to to write down sort of the model and think about how did we create other teams to do what we had been doing in Washington and Oregon. Um, and after we did California, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin, and I'll, I'll tell you sort of a secret, um, I didn't know what to call that grant because it was California, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin. So I just called it the National Girls Collaborative, even though it was only three states, right? I didn't know what else to call it. Um, our program officer uh, contacted us, I think we were about halfway through that grant, and she said uh, she wanted to create a program at the National Science Foundation that sort of followed the extension services model. Um, that's a model often used in agriculture, where there's an extension service agent that has information and provides it out to the rest of the community. And she felt that what we were doing followed that model and so she invited us to write a grant for a five-year proposal where we uh, replicated to 20 more states and so we called that grant advancing the agenda in gender equity um, and then we we were um, we've been so fortunate to be funded by the National Science Foundation for all this time we were invited to apply for another five-year grant and what we did for that grant is we pulled all of our leadership team members together and really analyzed the data we'd collected over all that time to see where, what were we doing well and what did we still have to do to create greater impact. And we realized that we weren't really serving girls of color. Um, we weren't looking, helping youth with disabilities. Uh, we weren't really building the capacity of the programs to serve girls in the ways that we wanted to. And so uh, we called that one a diverse workforce, and that's the current grant that we're working on right now. So from that story that I just mentioned, you can see that these are really our project goals to really maximize access to shared resources because I'm sure this happens here in Australia, it happens in the United States, there's amazing resources already created, right? You hear that phrase, let's not recreate the wheel, right? And so what we do is we try to provide access to those resources, send them out, summarize them, maybe uh, read a research paper and summarize those key nuggets of information and send those out to the educators. Because one of the things that we heard from these people that were serving girls is, they don't have time to read the academic journals, but they need to benefit from those lessons, the, the research that's coming out. And by doing that, we really strengthen the capacity of existing programs. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, our sort of giant goal is to collaborate to create the tipping point in gender equity for STEM. So I find that often when I give these talks, you know, I use terms that might be unfamiliar and so I've started putting sort of my glossary at the front so that you understand as I'm talking about the way the National Girls Collaborative Project works sort of what I'm referring to. So a collaborative is a state or regional network um, where 
we're in 40 states, but we have a few states that are together. So for example, Massachusetts and Rhode Island are together in the Southern New England Girls Collaborative Project. And one of my favorite names is Magic. That's the Mid-Atlantic Girls Collaborative Project. Um, and that's Delaware, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, so we let them sort of self-organize and sometimes states work together. The Great Plains Collaborative is North and South Dakota. Um, and other times, you know, a state like Texas is very large, right? So they're not going to partner with a neighboring state because it takes all their resources to serve Texas. So the convening organization is this lead organization that has a contract with us, and they're the ones that convene a leadership team of individuals from different programs across the state that say they want to work together delivering this model that I'm going to describe to you in a minute. Um, and then the leadership team is really a diverse group of stakeholders. We, when we train our uh, collaboratives, we basically give them a list these are the types of organizations that you want on your leadership team. So it might be a corporation. It might be somebody from the State Science Teachers Association. Uh, it might be somebody from the governor's office or from uh, state or local government. Um, and then every collaborative has an advisory board, but we call them the champions board because they really, they're high level people that champion the project and spread the word about the project. So this is our map. Uh, the green states are where we have collaboratives, and the blue states are states we don't have collaboratives yet, but hopefully soon. I know um, right now we're working with West Virginia and Kansas, so I'm hoping that this, some of those states will turn green um, sometime in the future. And then I have this, there, we're, oh, it's working. I have this animated map that shows sort of how we built our collaboratives uh, across the years. It's kind of fun to watch that fill in. I'll let it go one more time. The, it seems like the last few ones go fill up very quickly and it didn't really happen that way. Oh, back. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting just to show you this map and then of course that's the outline of Australia, right? On top of the United States. And uh, you mentioned the numbers, right, that are, are similar. But I think that, you know, Australia has some very particular um, barriers around collaboration because of your, the size, right, and the different um, sorts of, you've got rural and you've got urban. And we have those challenges in the United States as well. Um, but we've taken 14 years to get to where we're at, right? Lots of collaboration has occurred during that time. So this is our project impact. Uh, we have a directory. So you remember when I said that um, Mylene from Microsoft said, where's the list? Is there a list? So one of the things that we created in our model was an online directory of girls serving STEM programs. Um, since that time, that directory has changed names. It's something now called the Connectory that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But we have more than 4,000 programs in that directory. Um, we offer mini grants as an incentive to collaborate. So one of the things that we do is we offer this very small amount of seed money, but we um, invite two programs to come together and apply for a project that they both benefit from. Uh, and we've offered 241 mini grants and that served almost 40,000 participants. Um, I mentioned pizza and we have found that often Funding for mini grants goes for food. And I love to tell the National Science Foundation that we've spent probably $200,000 on pizza. Because we know that it's important, especially if girls are in after school programs, for them to, to eat, right? Um, and often they don't, they don't have funding for food. Uh, we've had a lot of visits to our website. Uh, more than 25 million and via all of the events that happen in all of the collaboratives around the country and our uh, national webinars, we've served um, more than 18,000 practitioners. And, and then there's that number of 16 million girls are served indirectly because we serve the educators that work directly with them. And then we always count the boys too because many of the programs that we work with also serve boys. And we also know that the strategies that engage girls in STEM work for boys. They're, it, they're great teaching and facilitation strategies. They're not special pink 
strategies that help girls. So why girls in STEM? Why is it important that we focus on helping girls get excited about science, technology, engineering, and math? And that's because we know that girls and boys, they don't have a significant difference in their abilities. But the differences exist in their confidence and interest. Um, and we know across the globe that women continue to be underrepresented in STEM at college and at the workforce level. And also because often STEM jobs are higher paying jobs, it's an equity issue as well. Um, so, uh, oh, my title's missing from this, but this slide should say, why collaboration? Why do we focus on collaborating? Um, and so we know that through collaboration, efforts to support girls in STEM, they're often uncoordinated and disconnected. So if we connect people together, even just by introducing them, and I saw some collaboration happening here before um, I, I started speaking, but you know, often it's difficult to partner or work with somebody if you don't know them, right? You just have to connect to each other. We, um, we, we frame it in terms of needs and resources. Everybody has needs and everybody has resources. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask for a little audience participation here. Um, I want someone to suggest a need that they have. Like what is a programmatic, a, not a personal need, a professional need that you have? What's, what's a need that you have that would help you do your work in a more efficient and more effective way? You've got the mic. I think you have to answer. Um, Trying. Training, great, training. What else? What's another need? Just one more. Um, I actually think um, for me the need would be to, it's the collaboration, it's the other like-minded people to work with. That's great, that's great. Um, and so what about resources? So everybody has resources, right? Oh, you had another need that, no, no, did you I want? Was, I, was probably on, I was probably on a different track, but I was just saying, really, as university educators, we need to increase the number of students coming into our courses. So that's part of it as well. It's that pathway, mm, mm, right? Absolutely. So mm. since you have the mic, what about a resource that you have, <laughs> especially here at a university? Well, we, we have we have the, the skills and the knowledge. Um, we also have um, the the laboratories for, for teaching some of these, you know, if it's a skill-based kind of activity. Yes, you have mm. space. And mm. it's, it's uh, interesting, often when I work with groups of people and I ask uh, what sort of resources folks have, people from universities often don't remember they have space. You have these amazing buildings where young girls could come, they could meet role models, and they could do activities, right? Great. Um, but there are always challenges to collaboration. So if you, if you take a minute and think about a partnership or a project that you worked on with somebody else, I'm sure you can think of some challenges. Not everything goes smoothly all the time, right? And so one thing we know is that often it takes more time to collaborate. You've got to communicate. You have to arrange each other's schedules, find a time to connect. Um, Sometimes the person that you're working with might not want to do things exactly the way you want to do things, or they might have a different needs and resources. Sometimes there's a lack of trust, especially if it's a new partner. It takes a while to build that trust and connection. Sometimes organizational systems don't encourage collaboration, uh, especially if a university, for example, is working with a small community-based partner. You have different sorts of organizational systems. What are some other challenges to collaboration? Culture. Culture. That's actually that's really that's a really important one to mention. What else? Time zones. Time zones. Yes, we were talking about that the other day. Time zones can be very difficult, and I know that. We have actually, as part of our protocol at the National Girls Collaborative, because we work across the entire United States, we always include three time zones in all of our communications. Um, it's really important, right, so that someone on the East Coast can see their time there, and someone on the Pacific Coast can see their time there. And it also helps so that people don't 
miss a meeting, right? We do these large national webinars, and sometimes I'm in there in a half an hour early to prepare, and I see someone trying to get in, right? And I realize they've got the time zone off, right? Um, and so really, time zones is really important, because if you, if you can't even connect, that's a challenge. Any other challenges to collaboration? Uh, this isn't as pragmatic as time zones, but um, I think that there are um, sort of organizational assumptions about status and about appropriate ways of doing things and how we validate knowledge and so on and so forth that uh, make collaboration that's between different types of groups very difficult. That's very true. Can you can you give it actually give an example, a very specific example? It sounds like you might have one. Sure. Well, um, sure. Uh, if you are in a situation where you have, for instance, social workers, pediatricians, and teachers working together to support children. Yes. Um, you have a natural sort of pecking order in professional identity. Yes. Pediatricians are at the top, social workers, and then educators or classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. And this can create enormous disparities in the, um, or challenges in the ability to be able to serve a child holistically. Yes. Yes, that's a really great example. And one of the things that the National Girls Collaborative Project tries to do is to provide training around what do you do about those kinds of issues. Like They're like issues of culture as well. So this is the definition that we use at the National Girls Collaborative Project. So you know, I mentioned how long we've been funded by the National Science Foundation. We've had a rigorous evaluation that entire time and collect lots of information. And we realized early on, as we started to do research on collaboration and all of the programs that we were working with, that we needed to have a common definition. And so this is the definition that we use at the National Girls Collaborative Project. And it's really about achieving something that you can't do by yourself. You really need to bring partners to the table so that you can achieve the goal. And this is our collaboration model, and this is also on our website where you could see it uh, in, a, in a much larger, probably more readable format. Um, but as we've uh, had more and more experiences with collaboration, we've actually, this model has become more and more complex. Because I used to think collaboration was easy. And then the more that I've worked with programs and worked with people, I realized it's a very complex process. And so what you can see on this model is that it's really about the girls. We've got a photo of the girls there, K-12 girls. Um, and in the middle, in the green circle, we have our collaborative leadership team. That's our local state-based leadership team. And they have their champions board. And then they offer professional development, um, they send out resources via newsletters to all the girls serving STEM programs. That's sort of the light blue circle up there on the left. Um, but one of the things that you'll notice about this model is all the feedback loops. We thought it was very important to build in lots of feedback between the girls serving organizations, the leadership team, the, the blue circles at the bottom, that's our national leadership team and national champions board and then the research community. And when we first started talking about creating this network, we realized that while we're uh, distributing and pushing out research nuggets to educators, that the researchers needed feedback as well about that, right? And so I think that's been one of the most impactful parts of the National Girls Collaborative Project is that we've been able to provide feedback to researchers about the work that they are doing. So these are um, what we call our model activities. Um, when we began the, the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project, we were really focused on in-person events at the local level. And then as we expanded, we realized that we needed to have a web presence and we needed to have virtual activities for states that hadn't formed a collaborative yet. So we have a very uh, content-rich project website. Um, all of the webinars that we've offered over the last 12 years are archived. I think there's something like 56 webinars on there that you can watch about different topics. Um, we have this thing called the Connectory. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And it's more than a database. It's also a collaboration tool. Uh, we've created another database called FabFEMS. It's a, a repository for mentor and role models. And I'll tell you about that in a few minutes, too. It's international. Um, we send out a newsletter every month that has a very specific format with uh, information about events and resources. We feature a FabFem. We talk about programs in the Connectory. 
Um, and then we do webinars on exemplary practices. And then at the local level, at every state, um, they offer professional development via conferences and forums and mini grants. And they also offer a local uh, newsletter. So we host something called a Collaboration Institute, and that's where we train our leadership teams, and we train them in offering events that are inclusive, that offer uh, the right professional development for their state. Uh, when we started doing this, every state said to us, you know, what you're doing in California isn't going to work here in Kentucky, or, you know, what you're doing in New York, that's, that's not going to work in Louisiana. And it's true, right? Every state, every place, every community has their own needs. And so one of the things that we work with our leadership team on is to ask to have what we call an information meeting, invite all the educators and the people that are interested in increasing girls' interest in STEM to the table and ask questions. What are the needs that you're seeing here in the community? What are the resources that we have that we need to distribute? And so at our institute, we train our leadership team members in how to do that, how to run events that foster collaboration, how to offer mini grants. And we do that whenever we have um, a new group of uh, leads coming into the uh, project. Um, one of the pictures on here is uh, fidget toys. Does that translate fidget toys here? So we're very transparent about all of the strategies that we use. So we might do something, and then we say, this is why we did it this way. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that many of you know from working at a university, you know, there's specific adult learning strategies, right, um, that help people focus and listen. And so we always have Play-Doh, um, these kind of weird fidget toys, um, post-it notes, those sorts of things out at all of our training. And it's fun to see when people go back, they often you know, send notes and say, where'd you get those toys? Like, I want those toys now at the trainings that I, I do. Um, so this is just a fun photo of an uh, institute we had in December in Seattle um, and leadership team members that we trained. It's also a way for us to connect our community together. Um, Often our leadership team uh, membership changes, right? People move on to other positions, somebody new comes in or a new convening organization will take over. And so that's an opportunity for us to bring them together and to teach them more about the model. And this is a photo of our national champions board. And you know, I mentioned that a champions board is a very important part of our, of our model. One of the things that we've learned as we've been doing this is that there's very specific elements that have to happen in certain ways for success to occur. And we had some collaboratives early on say, you know, we have an advisory board already. We don't need to create a separate champions board. And they wouldn't be quite as successful because that advisory board was already focused on another topic. And it, it might have been a complementary topic, but it wasn't uh, a group of people that came together just to support their Texas Girls Collaborative Project, right? And so we work with our leadership team members to help them uh, send an invitation to talk about what a champions board member expectations are. Um, and that's a very important uh, part of our model. So uh, why is collaboration important? I mentioned that we uh, have had a rigorous evaluation during the time that we've been doing this. And so we actually have data that shows that high levels of collaboration among educators and programs engaging girls increases the efficiency and effectiveness of those programs and their capacity. And so therefore increases the opportunities and improves experiences for girls. Uh, we also, every year we do what's called an annual survey of all of the programs in our network. Um, and so this data comes from our 2013 survey. Um, our 2015 survey actually has higher numbers. Um, but we've got 91% of the people that work in girls serving STEM programs say that being part of the National Girls Collaborative Project helped their program be more effective. Um, I mentioned this isolation that we saw when we were very first thinking about uh, creating a collaborative project. And so it's exciting to see that 88% of the educators that are involved with the National Girls Collaborative Project say that it reduced their feelings of 
isolation. You know, something as simple as coming to an event and being forced to talk to other people there, right? Because we all go to lots of conferences and it's easy to sit there and, you know, check your email or just sort of listen, but we use a number of strategies to encourage people to talk with each other and to share their needs and their resources as I, as I asked you all to share as well. Um, the professional development helps their program be more efficient and helps their program sustainability. So in our current five-year grant, um, one of the focus areas is on this organizational development piece. And um, we've been helping organizations with board development and fundraising. And you might say, what's it have to do with girls in STEM, right? Why does doing board training help a program? But we realize that if a program is strong, um, has a good fundraising base, uh, and is able to have a strong board, that helps them better serve girls. So that has been our focus in the, this current grant that we're in. So as we've been collecting all of this data from all of these programs via our annual survey and focus groups and we collect uh, data after every event, we realized that we had a lot to say about successful collaboration. And so we actually have created something called best practices in successful collaborations. And we have a workshop around that. Uh, it's, it's about a two hour workshop. So I'm not going to present that workshop now, but I'm going to give you sort of a, an overview of how we cover that information. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've taken all of those best practices and we've divided them into four areas. Um, and they're very complex. Prepare, look, plan, and build. And, you know, as we were writing this and creating sort of tip sheets and our workshop, we kept trying to make this be a little more academic. And we really couldn't because we found that, as I tell you a little bit about what these um, four stages mean, it really came to the core of this is how you can um, create successful partnerships and collaborations. So the first one is around preparing. Uh, often you might learn about um, writing an elevator speech, right? What would you do if you're in an elevator with somebody important? Often in the States, we talk about being in the elevator with Bill Gates, right? What would you say to him? Um, but really preparing, thinking about what is it that you have to offer as a collaborator, as a partner, and what is it that you need? And then to look for collaborators. So often people say, you know, I, I would like to find some engineers to come and speak at my program, but I don't know any. So where might engineers be? They might be at the Society of Women Engineers Conference, right? Um, they might be at a local corporation. So sometimes you actually have to go look for a potential collaborator. You have to go to their home and find them. And then when you do have a collaborator, to really plan that collaboration, to talk up front, make sure that you have similar goals. Because I'm sure if you think about challenges you, you've had with partnerships or with collaborators, there were times when maybe you weren't working towards the same goal, perhaps, right? And you discovered that too late. And so really planning that collaboration, having a collaboration agreement, um, deciding who's going to do what. And then to really build that partnership, to have a lot of communication back and forth. And that can be especially important if you work in different cultures, right? I, I know sometimes there are people that want to talk on the phone. And there, sometimes there are people that only want to do email, right? Um, it might be that you're collaborating with somebody who travels all the time and they're difficult to connect with. So really to build that uh, partnership together and then to celebrate. Part of the building is really celebrating that you had a successful project. Nope. So now I'm going to tell you about the Fab Femmes project. Um, when I told you that story about um, educators who wanted to connect with role models and they wanted to do mentoring, um, and then also those women at Boeing, they wanted girls to come to the Boeing factory and they didn't know how to find them, right? Um, we also discovered that as we've been working on this project that there were many programs in rural areas that didn't have 
um, female role models nearby that they could invite to their programs to speak. And you know, the research says that it can be very impactful for a girl to see a woman that maybe looks like her, um, might be from her same background, who's in a STEM career. And so we knew that was important. So the Fat Femmes directory is an international online searchable directory of women STEM professionals who are interested in working with girls and interested in working with programs. Um, we actually created this uh, in a partnership with the White House and the National Science Foundation and launched it at the White House um, a few years ago. Um, the United States is very interested in getting federal STEM women to work with girls serving programs. And so we created this database for them. And my guess is that you're all Fab Femmes, everybody's a Fab Femme, and can enter their information into this database. Um, when you're in the database, there are different ways that you can interact. You can say, oh, sorry, you can say, I just want you to be able to read my profile and learn about my experience. And that's perfectly fine. You can say, email me. And we monitor all the emails on the back end. Uh, but you can ask me questions. And so a girl can write a question to a fab femme. And you can write back. So what do you think the question we see most often going back and forth from girls to female Scientists, what do you see? That, what do you think that question is that we see most often? How did you get where you are? Is that the? How did you? No, that's not the question we see most often. Good guess, though. What else? You're holding the mic. Oh, don't do that. To me. <laughs> <laughs> How much money do you make? How much money do you make? No, that's not a question. Do you like what you do? Do you like what you do? No, that's not the question we see. So the number one question that girls ask Fab Femmes is, what's your favorite color? And sometimes we have Fab Femmes write to us and say, how do I answer this question? <laughs> and that's because girls want to connect. They want to know, right? Like, what's your favorite color, right? Like we say, so tell her your favorite color and then say, What's your favorite color, right? And then the conversation starts, right? Back and forth. The second most asked question is, do you have a pet? Right? So when we train role models and mentors, we say, start with that. Put up a picture of your pet. Or talk about your favorite color. Because girls want to connect. They want to know, oh, you're sure you're this amazing scientist, right? But you're also a person who maybe likes blue or purple or green or whatever, right? Um, but it, it's, we get that all the time from new Fab Femmes. Oh, I, I don't know how to answer this question. It's like, just say, my favorite color is this, right? So it's a great resource. Um, you can also indicate in there, if you're willing to go to a program and speak when you're available to speak, or if you're interested in Skyping. Right? So uh, this, became, this became a need for us when we heard all these programs saying we need role models and mentors. We don't have anybody local. And so we created this directory. There are about 800 profiles um, in there right now. The other collaboration tool that we have is the Connectory. So when I told you that story about creating an online database, we did that. And we had it. And we were continuing to build it. Um, and then uh, Time Warner Cable in the United States uh, really wanted to launch a large database for girl and boy serving programs around STEM and asked us to take on the challenge of managing all of the STEM programs in the United States because we had so much database experience. So we still have a database of girls serving STEM programs and we stream that at the National Girls Collaborative Project site, but we have a separate site called the Connectory um, which is the largest database of STEM programs um, in the United States, probably in the world. It's also international. And one of the cool things about the Connectory is we ask programs to enter in their needs and their resources and their collaboration interests. So you can see of this in this screenshot of a program entry that 
this program says that they need boys interested in STEM, they need girls interested in STEM, they need mobile programming. And then they list their collaboration interests. So as a program educator, you could go in, right, and write to this program and say, hey, you know, I have, I have mobile programming, right? I would like to work with you. And basically it's sort of a match.com for programs. So as we've been building our network of educators and collaborators, we found that uh, many of the leadership teams in our states, they wanted to provide even more services to their programs beyond some of the, um, the content that we had around evaluation and assessment and role model and mentor training. Um, they wanted to do more. Um, and we had this very effective distribution system um, I used to call it a dissemination system, and I, my slide still says that, but now it's really a distribution system of sending out information to programs across the United States. Um, and so we were actually about seven years ago approached um, by a group who wanted to write a National Science Foundation grant, and they wanted to take this really great underwater, underwater Lego robotics curriculum they were doing for teachers in high schools and adapt it for girls and spread it across the United States. And so we worked together and we realized that by training our leadership team members, we were distributing that curriculum and we had a system, right, of events, uh, communication system, and we could help scale that curriculum. So what we've done is we've created, we call these network projects. Right now we have about 14 of them going on. Um, and it's a way for us to continue to provide content and professional development out to all of our collaboratives. We have a system where we'll say, hey, we have this project, um, we have a couple projects right now on citizen science. We have this project, do you wanna be a part of it? And they say yes or no. Um, and we um, evaluate, they have to apply, and we, then we bring them together and they're trained by this content provider um, but they offer the training via all of the regular uh, events that they offer as part of their collaborative. And so this is just a, this just shows sort of how, uh, for example, we have New York, Alabama, and Texas, an ex example. They might be the sites that offer the content. And then in this slide, you can see that we have our partner that would be our content provider. Um, like we're working with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They're the people that do eBirds, for example. Um, and we're spreading their content across the United States. Um, and the collaborative leadership team members become the content specialists. And then, of course, there's always a feedback loop. We evaluate everything we do and collect data on that and constantly um, increase, upgrade, correct, make corrections uh, in our work. And then you can see the impact from um, having our train the trainer approach and having our collaborative leadership team members train educators so that then they're training the youth. And so we found that say if we train 10 states and each state trains 20 programs and each program serves 40 youth, you can kind of do the math and see how the impact increases exponentially. And we call those network projects. And this screen just shows some of the great network projects we have. Um, some of them have happened because of uh, National Science Foundation grants that I've been a part of. I don't know if anybody knows about SciGirls. So SciGirls is a PBS television series. Right now we're working on, on a season four. Um, it's sort of, sort of reality TV. Uh, it's real girls doing um, hands-on science. Uh, we've got, I think, about 45 episodes now. Um, we often do screenings across the United States, and then the girls do some sort of activity. Uh, in every 30-minute episode, along with these real girls working on some kind of science um, challenge or project, there's a mentor that helps them as well. And not all mentors are female. It's great if we have a female mentor, but you know, often I, when I talk about equity, I say, Men are not the problem and women are not the solution. Men can be great mentors and so we choose mentors for Psy Girls that are right for the episode and for the, uh, the local area. Um. So 
Oh, wow, good timing. Um, so, questions, discussion? Um, I think just uh, if people want to ask a question, if you could just uh, raise your hand and we will deliver you a microphone and it yeah. will give the camera time to swing round on a close-up for you. This so, is uh, Alex, he's actually one of my colleagues in engineering. Ah, yeah. in so an engineer. I'm engineer as well, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the, the actual impact for the girls, if you could, you talked about the impact of your programs and how that all filters down. Right. Do you have any data on the impact it makes for, for the individuals? The, the only data that we have right now is, is that a, pro, a program leaders, program um, educators tell us that they're better able to serve girls. But if we had data on the 16 million girls, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? But we haven't been able to get funding to do that. But we know we can reach those girls if we're able to find funding for it. So we've been really focusing on that program educator level. Um, so I have got two questions. Good. But the first one, I guess, is how did you reach those people at the top such that a program was um, introduced through the White House, I guess, you know, how, how to reach those higher level um, influencers. Kind of influencers, yes, and the money people. Yes, so, so this is where champions are really important. Um, we have sort of a pitch when we talk to champions. We ask them who else they know that they might be able to talk to. We don't ask them to come to meetings or to do a lot of work. We basically say we want you to talk about the project and connect us to people. So it's really, it's around all those connections that we make. Mm -hmm. I also have this philosophy that you just never know who knows whoever, someone else, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and so often collaborators appear because they talk to somebody that talked to somebody that you mm -hmm. talked to at a conference, right? Um, so we do lots of presentations and we do lots of sort of asking for, we're looking for, we're looking for a scientist, right? Does anybody know a scientist who does such and such? So it's, it's, it's asking, right? <clears throat> I think it's also being resourceful mm -hmm. and doing lots of searching. Um, that connection to the White House for Fab Femmes actually happened because there was a female scientist who went and spoke to a program and said, wow, like this, this was a great thing to be able to do, right? And told her, um, I think it's like her supervisor that she wanted other people in her department to also do this. And um, somehow somebody connected to the National Girls Collaborative Project as a place where we could house the database because we already had so many online tools. So I don't, I don't know if that, most definitely. No, that's great. Talking about it. Yes, absolutely. Talking about Talking it. I mean, I carry those Fab Femme circles with me all the time. I might be sitting on a plane and I hand, I hand one to someone, right? Or my card. Mm. That's terrific. And I guess my other question, it's sort of um, similar to what um, Alex was asking, but I guess uh, translating what you're doing into university enrolments, which will then facilitate a STEM career. And I'm wondering now with um, our connectiveness through social media, is there not a, a place or um, a, a, an ability to, to do that, to actually find out who has engaged in one of these activities and then link that back? Because that yes. would be really powerful evidence. I think that would mm. be really helpful. And I know that um, at least seven of our collaboratives are managed by university mm. outreach programs. And they've been talking about doing that, doing a survey of students, especially, um, I'm concerned about one day events. I think often one day events have more impact than we think but we don't have any data about that. So I think social media's, media is really gonna help us reach out. Maybe have a campaign, right? How did you get interested in STEM? Absolutely. Yeah. Just a, a quick question. In terms of the your selection or identification or outreach for mentors. Yes. Um, are you, do you find that established scientists um, or engineers are more effective than, for instance, undergraduates or graduate students who might be closer in, in sort of age and cultural connection or what have you? I'm a big fan of near peers. I'm a big fan of that, and I've seen the impact of that. I mean, I think a well-established scientist, like that's amazing, right? That experience is amazing, right? But a 10-year-old girl is gonna get super excited about a college freshman, 
right? A girl talking to her, right? So I think there's a role for both. Um, I think often we have to do more training with a well-established scientist because often, you know, I find that people that have been in the field for a long time, they share a lot of the, the trials and the journey, right? That might be a little TMI for a 10-year-old girl, whereas, uh, you know, a college sophomore who's like, really excited, just started learning about chemistry or engineering or whatever, has a lot of energy and the girl can relate to her. So I think there's a role for both, but I'm a fan of the, of the near peer. And we actually recently opened up Fab Fems to high school girls even, because we have some programs that want to have high school girls talk to middle school or elementary girls. Um, and we think that that'll be really powerful. I'm, I'm wondering if you also provide a way for the, the girls to connect or to stay in contact, you know, with your program or the overall, like, would be another database, I suppose, right? Yeah, actually, yes. And actually, what we've been doing with our mini grantees, so because our mini grantees get funding, we, we can ask more from them. Right, so we are collecting all that information on the girls from our mini grantees. It's a smaller subset, but we have that information, and actually, it's a proposal we've submitted recently to go back and collect data from those girls. So, because we have eight years of mini grantee data, so you think about that could be a kind of cool longitudinal study, right? I'm, I'm also thinking about the impact that could have as, as in participants in the future. I mean, they've gone through, you know, they're. They moved on. They've become an engineer or scientist or. They're role teacher. models. They're near peers, near right? Peers. Yes, that's a great suggestion. Um, Karen, could I ask you and also the audience here, um, how could this, how would this be different for rural, regional, and remote? girls as opposed to say urban girls where they can pop down to the university or go to an after school program. The kids who are more isolated in, in very small schools or um, being schooled at home. Well, so I think we need to use technology, definitely, if it's available, right? Um, I know that one of our very first mini grants that I always um, remember was one that I loved the most was some girls in rural Washington State, Latinas, um, they actually were able to go to that Boeing plant. Remember I told the story about the Boeing women engineers? And the only reason that happened, though, was because at our collaboration conference, one of those female engineers met the program leader for the program that those girls were in. I mean, and this is rural. They were um, from migrant families. And that program leader thought, wow, this will be a really great opportunity, right? And so they used the mini-grant money to put those girls on a bus drive them like eight hours, right? Stay overnight. But that only happened because the parents trusted that program leader, right? And I think that's not always possible, right? But if there's anything we can do around technology to connect those uh, young people to uh, role models, and maybe just taking the time to really train those educators, bringing them to a common place where we could do like train the training, right? So I think it's a challenge and I think it's something we always have to remember. One of our collaboratives purposely uh, connected urban programs and rural programs together in all of the work that they did. Uh, sometimes they'd have events and maybe only 10 people would show up, but it was important for those 10 people. So we didn't worry about the numbers. So that, does that help? I think we have time for maybe one more question. I think we're running out of time. All right. Yep. But excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so um, much. I think I, I found it a fascinating um, talk. I've been involved um, with women in engineering projects for longer than I care to remember. Um, and certainly in Australia, one of the problems we've always faced is the sustainability of projects, of any sort of innovation. They tend to only last as long as the person who started it right. is there. And so that sustainability of them, I think, has always been a problem for us. Um, but this certainly gives us lots of um, food for thought. But I do actually have a challenge um, for the audience. You spoke about the magic, the Mid-Atlantic Girls Collaborative. If we were to have one here in Toowoomba, in Queensland, in Australia, in rural, 
what would our acronym be? Now, I've Ooh. sat there for a few minutes thinking, and because I'm an illiterate engineer, um, I can't actually <laughs> think of many words that are appropriate um, that make a nice acronym. So that's my challenge uh, to you, to Ooh. if we have one, what would it be? Um, but thank you very much. I'm actually kind of envious um, that it wasn't around when I was a student. I know when I was first interested in engineering, um, I went to the guidance officer at school who was doing a talk and I sort of said, you know, I'm, I'm interested in engineering, you know, can you tell me, you know, like a little bit about it? And he kind of like looked me up and down and said, hmm, wouldn't you rather do nursing? So, um, so I'm, I'm, I think... Thank you it, for persevering. I question it sometimes, but, you know. <laughs> um, I think these sorts of projects um, where we introduce... Um, anyone, girls or otherwise, yes. to science, technology, engineering and mathematics um, is just absolutely brilliant. Um, I think our graphic collaborator over here has given us... It's amazing. Uh, it, and it just goes to show that scientists are multi-talented yes. people. Yes. People yes. tend to think of scientists as these boring, stuffy people in the back room but we actually have many skills. I'm not too sure what my other skills are, but clearly we have some excellent skills over here. Stand up comedy, um, maybe. So yeah. I'm sure we have, um, you can take some time to pursue, peruse that later on. Yes. Um, but on behalf of coming to wonderful sunny Queensland, we would like to thank you for your participation. Thank you so um, much. And I'd like to thank the audience for coming along. I know it's always a busy time, um, so thank you for giving up your time to come. Thank you to Susie Starfish uh, for your excellent uh, animations. Um, it will give us a something to keep and something for us to look at and talk about later on. So Take thank you. Put it yes. Out there, tweet it, yes. Yes. Great. Um, so thank you very thank much. Thank you. And Thanks I hope everybody. You enjoy your so stay. Much.